Welcome to Bogleheads on Investing, podcast number 13. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Bill Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is a neurologist, financial historian, author, advisor, and overall really smart guy. Welcome to Bogleheads on Investing, podcast number 13. My name is Rick Ferry, and I'm the host of this podcast. This episode, along with all episodes, are brought to you by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 corporation. Today, my special guest is Dr. William Bernstein, a favorite of the Boglehead community. Dr. Bernstein is a neurologist, financial historian, author, advisor, and a walking encyclopedia. Jack Bogle used to refer to Bill Bernstein as the smartest guy in the room. I always joke that when I have lunch with Bill, the three of us have a great conversation. So, with no further ado, it is my great pleasure to have on the Bogleheads on Investing podcast, Dr. Bill Bernstein. Welcome, Dr. Bernstein. Hey, glad to talk to you, Rick. And by the way, my first name is not doctor. It isn't, but everybody refers to you as doctor. <laughs> it gives me the creepy crawlies. It, uh, <laughs> I, get, I get PTSD and I pretend I've got a white coat on, you know? <laughs> you know, I, uh, I work with a lot of doctors and a lot of them are a lot less formal about being called doctor than it was, say, 25 years ago. Do you find that yeah, I think so. Uh, there's, 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 there's no question. I mean, I think that physicians these days are a whole lot more emotionally mature, at least young physicians are, than, than they were 30 and 40 years ago. Just for funny, anytime I even put in an email, you know, Dr. Smith or Dr. Jones, male or female, they'll always come back and say, no, 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 no. You know, call me by my first name. So I just stopped doing the doctor thing. They don't seem to mind. But I, when I was young, you called the doctor, doctor. So Bill, yeah. Bill, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, Rick, and how about you? I'm doing well. So speaking of uh, doctors, uh, but you were a neurologist at one time. Is that correct? Did I say that correct. correctly? Yeah. For, for, for so, 25, yes. 25 years. And uh, did you do operations? Like, I'm just curious, did you go deep no, into the no, brain? Or what no, did you do? no, 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 no. There's, there's a difference between a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. Oh, okay. a, a neurosurgeon is, is, is the guy or gal who operates. Uh, and neurologists are medical doctors. We work a lot with neurosurgeons, and they work a lot with us. Uh, but we we don't operate, and it, it loses me the, the the opportunity to tell a really good joke, which is that you know people look at me and say, "How hard was it to to learn finance at your age?" And I I like to tell them that well, yeah, finance is is hard, but it's not brain surgery. <laughs> okay. Yeah. At one point, you decided enough of all of the the noise on Wall Street and you were going to go out and investigate this on your own because you had come to the realization that what was going on out there on Wall Street was not working, at least not for you. And uh, you started going down the path of learning on your own, which a lot of physicians are now, which I find great, by the way. A lot of people are self-learning like you did. But uh, you you just kept on going after you went down that path and, and you got so into it that you decided to start writing books and you actually opened up an investment company. Can you elaborate on that? Well, sure. I mean, I, I live in a country that doesn't have a functioning social welfare system. So I had to, you know, basically save and invest on my own. And I had scientific training and I approached investing the way I thought that any scientist would, which is, you know, you read the basic tests, the peer reviewed uh, literature, you collect data, you built models. Uh, and I went and did all those things. And by the time I'd finished doing this in the early 1990s, I realized that I had something that was useful to other small um, investors. And so I wrote my first book, The Intelligent Asset Allocator, as basically an online book uh, in 1990. Five, and I give credit to Frank Armstrong for telling me that I should do that. And the, the rest just followed from that. You can't write about finance without two things happening. Number one is people ask you to start managing money. And number two, and more subtly, you come to the realization that you can't write about finance without writing about the history of 
finance and the history of economics. And so that opened up yet another career, which is, you know, writing books about economic growth and trade and things like that. Yeah, and I want to go down that path a little bit because uh, I want to eventually talk about Brexit and trade deals that we go to are going on with China and how all that affects us. But so from your lens, having written, is it four uh, history books now or economic work- history? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm working on my fourth. Uh, I've written three so far and there's a fourth that'll be coming out uh, in about a year's time from now. So Bill, the first economic history book you wrote was The Birth of Plenty. Just briefly what you learned in that book and then that how that led to the next book. It's a long, shaggy dog story, but one of the reasons why I became interested not only in economic history, but also in finance itself is because I knew 35 years ago that the most successful economies and the world's most successful securities markets existed in countries that spoke English. All of the daughter countries, great daughter countries of of England, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, all had very successful economies and all had securities markets with higher returns. Very few other countries matched that. Sweden, Switzerland came came fairly close. Uh, And I, I wondered why that was. And it turns out it's nothing to do with the English language, but what it does have everything to do with is English common law. And I quickly came to the realization that it was English institutions, and particularly the common law, rule of law, and equality under the law that uh, that were behind the prosperity. And of course, that's not an original lie to me. Doug North got you know a Nobel Prize for realizing that 30 years ago. That's how I came to write birth of plenty which was a a modestly successful book and as i was had just finished that book i get this phone call from a man by the name of brando skyhorse who it turned out was an acquisitions editor for grove atlantic press and he said you know i'd like you to write a book about about economic history uh, of trade, the economic history of trade. And so I said, well, in the first place, I don't know anything about it. Um, in the second place, uh, I'm not interested in it. And in the third place, you've got the wrong Bernstein. The person you wanted was, of course, Peter Bernstein. Peter Bernstein, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, and there was this this awkward silence at the end of the line. And he said, well, we, we had lunch with him last week. and we, we did offer him the project. And he said that he was busy. Uh, he was writing his history of, you know, the Erie Canal at the time. Uh, and and Peter said, but there's this other Bernstein <laughs> okay. you, you ought to read. So I said, I don't know. There's other things I want to write. And I went out into the uh, the family room where my wife was finishing her coffee and the New York Times crossword puzzle. Uh, and she puts down her coffee and she puts down the New York Times crossword puzzle. And she says, you know who Grove Atlantic Press is? And I said, uh, no. And she said, well, you, you've heard of the Atlantic Monthly. And I said, yes, I know the Atlantic Monthly. And she said, you know, and you know what Grove Press is? And I said, well, yeah, you know, Doris Lessing and P.J. O'Rourke and Henry Miller and people like that. And she said, right. She said, if you value your career as a nonfiction writer, you will write whatever it is they want you to write. <laughs> okay. So that's how I came to write uh, Splendid Exchange, uh, which succeeded beyond my, my wildest uh, dreams. It was very well received. And, you know, I mean, one occasionally gets bad reviews uh, on places like Amazon. But the major, you know, the major media reviews that I got were uniformly uh, uniformly positive, And it's also been the source of any number of really interesting speaking gigs over the past 10 years. Bill, from the perspective of trade, we're in a interesting situation in history right now where we're beginning to see trade wars that one could argue we are starting, not only between us and China, but there might be issues with Brexit, for example, between the UK uh, and continental Europe and Ireland. We see trade wars, if you will, and and trade problems potentially increasing in the future. Based on your work and your knowledge of it, where do you see these things going? Well, not not in a good place. 
to to say that trade wars are easy to win is akin to wearing a bright neon sign on your forehead that says, I don't know the first thing about history. Uh, we, we had trade wars in the 1930s, and not only were they disastrous from a geopolitical point of view, but they were disastrous from a military point of view as well. You can make a very good case that the Smoot-Hawley tariff and the tariffs, uh, the other the other tariffs that uh, that gave a rise to in, in retaliation were a direct cause of World War uh, II. Uh, and it's not an accident that the people who set up the, the what became the, the World Trade Organization were people in the State Department who swore never again, you know, we're never going to have this again. We want an international order that prevents the geopolitical catastrophe you get from trade wars. Um, it does appear highly likely that that Britain will go crashing out of the EU. Uh, and if that happens, it will not be an entirely negative event for the following reason, which is that it will prove to be a relatively cheap object lesson about what happens when you follow protectionism to its final conclusion. Um, if you think you can you know, destroy the international trade order and thumb your nose at it, or, or, or an organization like the EU and get away with it, you're going to be sadly mistaken. Uh, you know, I, I've always thought it was useful to have a couple of communist regimes around, like North Korea uh, and Cuba, as object lessons to the rest of the world, um, you know, in terms of the risks and the costs of, of a truly communist form of government. Well, that's an interesting perspective, Bill. So basically, there's a lot more to trade wars than just trade. There's a, there's a very predictable sequence of events that occurs when you start a trade war. Uh, in the first place, you're shooting yourself in the foot because it's a tax on your consumers. To anyone who doubts that, I suggest you go out and try and buy a washing machine right now. So that's the first thing that happens. Secondly, it damages your own domestic corporations who need foreign inputs because they're going to be spending a lot more. The third thing that happens is that you get retaliatory tariffs. And then the fourth thing that happens is you get shooting wars. And history is rife with trade wars that evolved into shooting wars. I mean, the Dutch and the, the British uh, fought four of them a couple of centuries ago just over the issue of trade. Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? Well, they attacked Pearl Harbor because we embargoed the royal. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're just you're, you're playing with fire. It's a stupid thing to do. Well, let's move on to Masters of the Word. And I, I recall I, I read the book before you uh, published it. Thank you for letting me do that. And I thought it was a fascinating book. Well, it sank like a stone. I, I had a good time writing it. And I, what I learned about it is that, you know, writing a long form history book is really about the process. And if you don't enjoy the process, you shouldn't be writing the book. And it would have been nice if I had gotten the frosting on the cake of a successful book. But at the end, I learned an awful lot. Uh, and the reason why it, it, it sank was simply uh, because media academics, who are the people who are going to be reviewing the book, didn't like it because I didn't pay proper homage to McLuhan and Kittler and Derrida and people like that who I didn't find terribly relevant to my story. So it was, a, it was a lesson in a number of regards. So just to regress a little bit, the book was about the history, if you will, of communication and that how that affects society. Yeah, the basic thesis of the book was that access to communication technology is what determines politics. So, for example, in the ancient world, very few people knew how to read and write. Not only did they not have the time to do it, but the, the writing systems that were in place were extremely complex and took a long period of time. So no one could afford the time to learn them. So if you were a scribe, if you could read and write, which had to have been less than 1% of the population, you were the combination of a software engineer and a venture capitalist and an investment banker all rolled up into one. You were the, the person who could basically gave everybody else uh, their orders. And that changes around six or 700 BC when the Greeks 
inherit the Phoenician writing system, which doesn't have vowels, and they put vowels into it. And all of a sudden, with the presence of vowels and consonants, a clever five-year-old can learn how to read. And at the time of, say, Pericles, probably 50% of Greek citizens who were all, of course, all men, could read and write. Well, it's not an accident that democracy develops in ancient Greece. And you can jump a couple of millennia ahead of that, and you can look at Nazi Germany and see that their degree of control over the population basically stemmed from the fact that they controlled the leading-edge communications technology of the era, which was, of course, radio. You know, Brett Stevens wrote a very fine column about that in the New York Times last week. It's not an accident that, that totalitarianism has its high watermark in the 30s and 40s with the rise of radio. But radio was just a one-way communication. It went out, but it didn't come back. Exactly. If you wanted to say something back to the radio, you were out of luck. So then you enter the internet, and suddenly now it goes both ways and things change again. Exactly, exactly. Now, the question is, is you know, the other really interesting story was, you know, is, were some of the things that people don't talk about very much that contributed to the fall of communism. Obviously, it was a miserable economic system, and that didn't help. But the, the Russians, the Soviets, weren't nearly as smart as the Germans, because the Germans made radios that made it almost impossible to receive foreign broadcasts, okay? The Russians built these very sophisticated shortwave you know, rate receivers that could get, you know, Voice of America, Radio Liberty, the BBC. And when you read people like Lech Walesa and Václav Havel, the first thing they tell you is that if it wasn't for Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe, which of course were CIA plants, they wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And so here we have a situation where instant news everywhere, all around the world, you know, if there's if the, a one tear gas canister gets shot in Hong Kong, the whole world knows about it within 10 seconds. How is that changing things? Well, it makes the cost of totalitarian suppression much higher. The, the Hutus in, in Rwanda, you know, 25 years ago could use the radio to direct their genocide. And the people on the other side didn't have any way of publicizing what was happening. Well, if, if they tried that today, there would be cell phone videos uh, that would be flooding the Internet and people would have intervened, intervened a whole lot faster. I think, you know, the, the one thing you can, you know, you can talk about the, the, the negative effects of social media. But one thing I'm quite certain of, which is that the Internet and cell phones have made genocide a whole lot harder. Let me ask about what you're working on now. I know you're. You're working on another book. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm working on a modern version of a book that I'm sure you've read, too, which is 178 years old, called Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay, who was a Scotsman. And the book is famous, as we both know, in finance, because it described the three great bubbles of the 17th and 18th century, the tulip mania, which <laughs> Mackay got completely wrong, and the South Sea and Mississippi Company bubbles, which he did a fairly good uh, uh, job with, or at least a fair job with. And I can remember reading that book in the, the 1990s and thinking to myself, my God, this is fascinating, but I'm never going to see anything like this, of course. And then all of a sudden, right in front of my eyes, I saw the same kind of behavior as Kai observed with tech stocks uh, and the popular mania that surrounded them. And it saved me a lot of a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and I, I'm certainly not the only person who had that experience or by many decades was the first person to have that experience because the book has been in print ever since 1841. And the 1932 edition, uh, the forward to it was written by Bernard Baruch, who had his bacon saved in 1907 by it. So that's the first thing that impressed me about it. And then the, the, the other thing that really impelled me to write the book was the rise of the Islamic State in the Middle East and how the Islamic State and their predecessor, ISIS or ISL, ISIL or however you want to refer to it, and how they were able to attract people from tens of thousands of people from around the world, some of them from very comfortable Western societies, to hell on earth and to fight and to die there. And of course, Mackay wrote about religious manias 
too. And so I had to write a book that married the two of them, those together, because they were both popular manias, both financial manias and religious manias propagate by the same social mechanisms. So I wanted to write about that. And that's what I'm finishing up on. And is Bitcoin and cyber currency part of that? I had to ask. Uh, it gets about two sentences or three sentences. Um, okay. Uh, it's just, it's quite frankly, it's it's not big enough to make it into my book. It still, it still makes headlines. But you don't very often meet people who will talk your their, your heads off about it, you know, at, at, at a cocktail party, which is typically what happens during a mania of any sort. Back in the 1990s, people were experts. You go to your local barber to get a haircut, and they were experts on tech stocks. I don't think you have that with cyber currency. I don't think anybody claims to be an expert. I think they all know what they're doing is speculation. Although the really interesting thing is that it seems that every other Uber driver that I encounter wants to talk about the inverted yield curve. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> and negative interest rates get to be a big thing right now as well. A lot of people tend to want to talk about negative interest rates, which, you know, speaking of that, let's get into this a little bit. Negative interest rates are a new phenomena. I mean, as far back as what I can tell, right? Years going back. I mean, interest rates may have been low because inflation was low. But where do negative interest rates get countries like Germany and Japan, Switzerland? I mean, where does that all go? Well, I, I, I tend to look at negative interest rates more as a symptom uh, than as a, a root cause of, of anything. It's obviously not good for fixed income investors. But what it's a manifestation of is several different things all coming together into a perfect storm. Thing number one is something that I, that I like to write about, which is that you know societies get wealthier, the rate of return falls. And that's true of both stocks and uh, bonds. Uh, inequality comes into it as, as well. You know, you, you have more and more capital getting hidden away into people's accounts and it's not getting spent. You know, people don't have money to spend on rents and houses and food the way they should and certainly on their children's education because, you know, almost all of the increase in income is going to the 1%. And what do the 1% do with their money? Well, they put it away into stocks and bonds. So that's the first thing that's happening. The second thing is we've got a tepid economy. And so the demand side for capital is down. So the rate falls because of that. And then finally, you've got central banks getting into the act and buying up fixed income assets onto their balance sheets. So all three of those things are are causing the reduction in in interest rates. I'm not sure there's anything to do about it, but it's just a it's just a fact of life. The one thing that it does do is it makes people enthusiastic about long bonds because that, that's the an asset class that's done very well with the fall in interest rates. I, you know, I think that T-bill rates are certainly not as low as they've ever been. They were actually depending on how you measure it, negative during the Great Depression very early on. But, you know, a, a long term, a 30 year treasury bond is yielding, what, 2.3 percent or 2.4 percent. That's historically anomalous. And so it makes people very excited about, you know, long bonds, and particularly about leveraged bonds in a portfolio because they've done so well. And it's, you know, they're an excellent way, a way to, to, to chase prior performance. Larry Summers wrote something recently in talking about negative interest rates. And he said something that caught my uh, ear. Basically, he said, if you have very low interest rates, it keeps a lot of companies around that have no business being around, that they should go under. And because they're not going under, the, the system is going to become clogged with a lot of deadweight companies that should have gone bankrupt but won't go bankrupt because interest rates are low. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the Austrians, the Austrians, that was something that the Austrians like to write about. You know, Schumpeter uh, certainly wrote about that. And I'm pretty sure that Hayek wrote about it, um, you know, wrote about it, too, which is the danger of low interest rates is is not inflation. OK, in other words, when you you can get inflation if you lower interest rates because people start spending. But if you're you know beyond the zero lower bound, then simply what happens is uh, that you get asset class bubbles. And so a lot of companies wind up getting capital or keeping their capital that, as Larry Summers says, have no business being around. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed is that the tax cuts that corporations got, uh, the money, the extra capital that they had that came in, 
there wasn't really any big spike in capital spending with that money. But what there was was buybacks. Uh, there were uh, dividend increases. But, you know, the idea of giving uh, companies a tax cut was they would come back uh, and spend more money, uh, invest more money for the future. That doesn't seem to be what they're doing. Yeah, we're, 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 we're in a capitalist fool's paradise. And I, I'm not talking about that politically. Uh, what I mean by is a capitalist is anybody who has capital. That's you and me. Uh, and we're in a fool's paradise because we've got these bloated portfolios that are inflated by low interest uh, rates. Uh, and we feel rich. It seems that we're rich. But in fact, the earning power of what we own, uh, and certainly the the dividend stream from what we own uh, and the interest stream from what we own is is not all that impressive. Uh, if you had to, if you have to live on your income now, you're in trouble. Yeah, which gets us to where do you put your money? Um, you know, with the potential for even lower interest rates in the U.S. Now, I, I know that that's not a uh, a popular opinion about where interest, where interest rates are going, but we have 1.4 percent on the 10-year. And I think the probability of the 10-year dropping below 1% is as high as the probability of it going over 3%. So, I mean, we could have even lower interest rates going forward. You know, we have earnings that are slowing, uh, dividends uh, increases, which are better than what they were in the past, but they're slowing too. We have, you know, no more tax cut on the corporate side. We already had that. Buybacks are beginning to slow. Where do you put your money, Bill? <laughs> I put my money where I've always put it, which is in a, a prudent mixed portfolio. I don't know where else to to put it. I'm not going to put it under the mattress. I'm not going to buy, you know, a couple of, you know, a ton or two of gold. You you keep I've always, you know, I've always kept my 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 fixed income durations fairly low so that if things spike up, I don't lose too much money there. Uh, and, you know, you have to you own some equities. Uh, equities abroad are not badly priced. European Japanese equities are at least reasonably priced. Emerging markets equities are even more than reasonably priced. You know, on the other hand, I'm going to be spending in dollars, so I'm not going to be investing, you know, much more than 40 percent of my money abroad. Anytime I put something on the bogleheads about expected returns from equities or fixed income going forward, I always get a lot of pushback. Oh, you don't know what they're going to be. It's, you know, uh, you know, nobody knows what the returns are going to be. But in order to invest your money, in order to come up with an asset allocation and a, some sort of an investment plan, uh, you need to have estimates of return for equities and estimates of return for fixed income and estimates of return for cash. And I know I have my estimates, which I use. Uh, what are your estimates? Uh, I think that right now, bonds, notes, anything you know beyond a couple of months probably has a negative expected real rate of return. You know, it can't be any other way. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you if you think that inflation over the next ten years is going to be less than one point one percent. Um, you know, I've got a bridge that I want to to sell you. I think U.S. stocks have probably an expected. Well, and I, I may want to buy that bridge, by the way, if it's paying it, tolls to get across. I I, it, am, I might be interested, so let me know afterwards. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll name the bridge after after we're off the call. And you know, I think that that the cash probably has a yield which is not too much less than than inflation, so not too much less than than zero. And then finally, U.S. stocks, maybe about 3% real, and foreign stocks, maybe 4% real, and emerging markets, maybe a little bit more than that. You know, in the U.S., uh, my view of a of rate of return on equities, and I'll use nominal instead of real, is about 6% on equity and 2.5% on bonds. If you're looking at corporate bonds, you, maybe you'll get 3 uh, because you have 2% inflation. I know you might be looking at lower than that, but if you use 2% inflation, 2% uh, real GDP per capita growth, if we get it, and then 2% dividend yield, you put it all together, you just zero out any PE multiple expansion and you get about a 6% return on equity. So that's how I get to 6% on equity in the long term. And then the 2.5% on bonds is simply whatever the 10-year Treasury bond is now 
plus a 10-year corporate combined together, you know, 50-50, you know, looking forward over the next 10 years, it's a pretty good predictor of what that return will be. I mean, am I far off? No, no, you're not. And, and the trick is, no matter what estimate you give or I give, especially for stocks, uh, you, you have to take it with a grain of salt. I mean, someone took me to task uh, in, in the, the questions portion of your post. You know, what they wanted to ask me was, how did I get stocks so wrong over the past 10 years? Because 10 years ago, I mean, it was 19 years ago. Yeah, it was 19 years ago. I predicted like two and a half percent for stocks uh, and uh, they were actually seven percent. Well. You know, over 19, if the standard deviation of stocks is 16% a year, make life easy over 16 years, uh, then the, the, the standard error is going to be 4%. So I was a little more than one standard error off, okay? Uh, but, but, way, but, but you're a doctor. Yeah, well, there's still, st- you know, but, but I, I still have to obey the laws of statistics. So, <laughs> so, I mean, even over 30 years, I can give you a 30-year estimate. But even over 30 years, I mean, the square root of 30 is like five and a half. So one standard deviation on that estimate is 3%. Two standard deviations is 6%. So if I say a real return of 3%, well, it could be 9% or it could be minus 3%. So getting to back to what you said about the Boglehead question, we can go there now because we had a number of questions from the Bogleheads forum A lot of them are investing questions, so we can get more into the nitty-gritty of each asset class and factor investing and tips and and so forth. Let me go ahead and go to the Boglehead forum, and because I always post on the Boglehead forum, bogleheads.org, who my guest is, and then I ask the forum members who are registered to uh, ask intelligent questions that are not related to them personally. Uh, that I can ask. So here we go with the first question. So Bill, uh, I had a number of Bogleheads asking about factors like value, momentum, quality, and uh, you've written a lot about this uh, in some very prestigious academic journals about factor investing. Uh, You're well known to have yourself in your client portfolios use factor type funds, but factors have not done well in the last, say, 10 years. And uh, first of all, could you comment on that and then comment, uh, if you can, if you have any thoughts about the valuation of various factors going forward? I knew I was going to be asked this. Uh, I went and did what any person does in that position, which is you go and you look at the Ken French uh, website and you download some data and you massage it. The, the primary way you look at how... No, she, you, I, I never do that. I, no, I, I you believe do that. that. You would accuse us of doing things <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, it just tells how warped I am. And, and what you do, the, the simplest database you can look at is just the global database of U.S. stocks. And you sort purely by price to book, which is the, the, historically the way they've looked at value versus growth. There are obviously other ways, as you well know, to... To do it, they do a 30, 40, 30 sort. So they look at the 30% uh, that are the cheapest by price to book, the 30% of the most expensive, and then there's 40% in the middle. So if you look at the price to book ratio, or actually the inverse of that, the book to market ratio of the cheapest stocks versus the expensive stocks, it's always going to be much greater than one, okay, because that's how you're defining it. All right. And it turns out that the average value uh, over the past 50 years is about 4.8. Okay. That ratio is 4.8. So, in other words, the cheapest 30% have a book to market value that is about 4.8 times the most expensive stocks, which is about what you'd expect. Okay. And it turns out that when you look at what happens to that ratio over time, it corresponds precisely to how value has done versus the market or value has done relative to growth, however you want to look at it. So, for example, if you look at the period from, say, 1995 to 2000, which was a terrible period for value, you find that ratio rising from about four to about almost 10, 
okay, which was historically unprecedented. That was, you know, the height of the, the, the bubble in growth stocks around 2000 or so. And then if you look at what happened to that ratio uh, over the next 10 years or so, you find that it went from 10 all the way down to about 3.8. Okay, uh, and those were salad days for value stocks. You you know it was, it was shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, everybody got excited about value stocks because they beat growth box stocks by several percent per year. Well, what has now happened since about 2011 or so is that ratio has gone up from about three point I don't know 3.6 or 3.8 all the way up to almost six. Okay, so what has happened to the value premium? It's done very poorly. All right. Well, it turns out that the, the current value about six is more than a bit above its historical average, which is another way of saying that value stocks are not are now cheaper. All right, and I think that people are getting very uh, discouraged uh, with value investing, uh, and that's a good sign because that corresponds to uh, John Templeton's point of maximum pessimism. Yes, but only when the blood is dry. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. I, I think the blood is drying, but it's not dry yet. But um, I, you said something. I don't know what it was, five or six years ago, and we were having the same conversation about value. And uh, it, it was too easy back then. In other words, you say we need blood in the street in order for the value, the true value investors, to, to, to earn a return. I was talking with Wesley Gray. Uh, I had him on as a guest, and you know he's a quant from the University of Chicago. Uh, Alpha Architect uh, is his company. And uh, I had him on as a guest, and, and he was saying... The people who make money in value earn their value premium. What we have now is basically a, a cult of value renters, where we had a lot of people come in and buy value stocks using these newfangled ETFs. And, you know, it, it, there was a whole lot of value investing for the wrong reasons because they were trend followers getting value premiums down to this uh, 3.8, like you said, uh, you know, a lot of money going into it at the wrong time. But now it's come back the other way. There's blood in the street, a lot of blood in the street. Uh, I don't know if the blood is dry yet or maybe there's going to be more blood. But, you know, to me, I agree with you that we're getting to a point where, gee, it's almost safe to invest in value again. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if we're at that point, but, you know, you never know when you're at that point. And the smart thing you do is you just, you know, you, you stay to your, you stay true to your, your discipline. It was JP Morgan who very famously said that a, a bear, a bear market is when stocks are returned to their rightful owners. Uh, huh. and, exactly. Yeah, there you go. And, and I think the same thing is true of, of the value, uh, the value premium. We've, what we've had over the past five to six years is a lot of, you know, dentists getting sold by their broker on factor investing in smart beta. Uh, and you need to wash those people out uh, in order to, to, to earn the value premium. How come you always pick on dentists? Because I remember every joke that you make, instead of picking on doctors, you pick on, you know, dentists. Instead of picking on surgeons, you pick on dentists. I, I, is that something that, like, in your uh, other occupation, some rivalry between dentists and uh, medical doctors? Yeah, it, it, it may be, you know, in, in, in medical specialty and medical training, you, you refer to purely procedural specialists as dentists. Uh, it's not a compliment. <laughs> I remember you had a joke about the Lubies, uh, two dentists sitting together at Lubies talking about stocks and the market will never be, um, uh, or index funds will never take over the whole market if there are two dentists sitting together having lunch at Lubies trading yeah. stocks or something like that. Very, 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 very close. You, 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 you got, you got the, the vowels and the, um, and the consonants right. I do what I, what I, but what I believe I said was two dentists having lunch in Lubbock. Oh, Lubbock. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, so we can go out to a, another question that the Bogleheads have. One of the Bogleheads uh, asks how you feel about international REITs. Uh, in international bonds, there's always a lot of controversy about those two asset classes. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, you know, as far as international bonds go, I just don't like them. Uh, for, even forgetting about the fact that most of them have negative yields right now. And the reason is you, you have a choice when you're owning international bonds. You can either not hedge them, in which case you've got a relatively safe bond, a sovereign bond, but it's got overlaid on top of it 
industrial grade currency risk. So that's not a bright idea. Or you could hedge it back to the US dollar. And then what you wind up when you do that is just a very expensive domestic bond. So neither of those two things make sense. Now, a long time ago, I did occasionally invest in foreign denominated bonds that were not hedged. And I did that when whenever I went to Europe, and I thought that it was cheap. Okay, so you know, if, if you were lucky enough to visit Europe, let's say, in the early to mid 80s, when you had a 10 franc dollar uh, or a, a British pound that was trading fairly close to, to par, uh, you know, back in the day when the pound was actually worth something, and when those currencies had fat yields attached to them, yeah, that was a, you know, an opportunistic play. But I haven't seen anything attractive in that regard over the past uh, 20 years for the simple reason that foreign currencies have been fairly expensive in general over the past 20 years. And now, you know, with the interest rates, it's I wouldn't I wouldn't do it at any currency valuation because of the low interest rates. So that's international bonds. International REITs, yeah, I think that's a good way of diversifying a REIT portfolio and diversifying uh, in in general. They're say also trading at relatively attractive valuations relative to US REITs. Now that's not exactly REITs, it's real estate where there are management right. companies and there are development companies and so forth. Right. Um, okay. One of the Bogle heads asks about the duration of your bonds. Should you should they continue to hold uh, only short duration uh, bonds as they are getting near retirement? And and here's the line that I, I think is funny. Uh, that's a no brainer in today's interest rate environment. Uh, I remember you and I having a conversation about this 10 years ago. We were on a Bogleheads panel together and we were talking about bonds. Somebody asked, you know, where should you have the duration of your bond portfolio? And I think you said 10 years ago, it's a no brainer, you know, have them in short term. And I, I disagreed with you on that. I said, well, I, I don't know, but I'm just going to, if your liabilities are intermediate term, you should probably have intermediate term bonds. So I'm going to go back to you now. Is it a no brainer to have short term bonds in your portfolio? Well, I can't be right about everything. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, you, you know, I was certainly wrong uh, about that. But I think as a general rule, you want to take your risk um, uh, in, you know, in, in, in stocks and not in bonds. And I think that going out in intermediate term, uh, into intermediate term bonds is too much of a risk if rates spike up. And let's face it, there's not a lot of juice left in in, in that play. And there's huge complexity um, right now in, in bonds. I mean, in just one little move up in, in interest rates on uh, intermediate term, and you're going to have some... I mean, the duration have expanded on a five-year or 10-year treasury bond. The duration, because interest rates are low, dur you know, duration is a factor of uh, the bond maturity date, the, the coupon payment, and uh, you know where interest rates currently are. So... If interest rates are, you know, five or six percent, and you had a jump of one percent, it wouldn't hurt the bond portfolio as much as it does now, where interest rates are less than one and a half. Yeah, exactly. And I would say, you know, when it comes to bond duration, I would say two things, uh, and I would put, you know, two and two together and make four. The, the the one thing that I would I would say is that your bonds are what allow you to sleep at night. OK, uh, when everything else is is going down the you know what uh, you want to have something that you can look at and say, yes, that pays for next week's groceries or next month's uh, rent or or mortgage uh, payment. And your bonds allow you to do that. So you, you, you don't want to take as much, you know, that much risk with your bonds. The second thing I would add on to that is to realize that between 1940 and 1980, the real return of long-term U.S. Treasuries, and that includes, uh, you know, reinvested interest, was minus 60 percent. All right, and you don't want that happening to your your the safe assets, the things that are allowing you to sleep at night. I have friends who are in Europe who are investment advisors, uh, and they're dealing with negative interest rates. And what you said about being able to sleep at night by having bonds, that we're actually getting on the other side of that curve over in Europe, where people now are actually not sleeping at night because of their bond holdings and negative interest rates. So it's, even if they're short terms, this is an interesting phenomenon that's taking place in the global financial markets that has never taken place before. And this is 
where I think we're in a, a new area. Uh, if we get into negative interest rates like the rest of the world, people are not going to be looking at bonds as though there is sleep at night type investment. Do you agree? Yeah. Now, again, I'm putting myself, let's say, in the position of a northern European person who is spending local currency. If I see, I, if I see negative interest rates, okay, I'm also seeing something else, which is that because of you know the European Union and because of increased immigration, uh, most of the things you want to do in Europe have actually not gone up in price and may have fallen in price. I, I every time I go to Europe these days, I'm amazed at how reasonable it is. And so you know the, the one exception to that, of course, is if you have to buy a house or an apartment. All right, but I'm assuming you already own a house in an apartment, and all you have to do is meet your living expenses, and you're, you you want a fixed income substitute. Well, that's the point where I trot on down to the bank and I rent a great big fat safety deposit box and I put my cash in it. Okay, and then I'm not getting negative interest rates. So one one of the bogleheads come back and he asks, if under what circumstances would you recommend going longer term on bonds? What would have to happen for you to go longer term? Oh, I'd want to see a great big uh, steep yield curve. I want to be rewarded for going long, and I'm gonna, I want to be rewarded a lot. As we continue with our fixed income discussion, how do you feel about municipal bonds? A lot of people are talking about these embedded liabilities and the quality of municipal bonds going down, bankruptcies, and so forth. Where do you stand on municipal bonds? Well, you know, the thing that's always said about municipal bonds is that during the Great Depression, very few of them went bankrupt, very few municipalities uh, went bankrupt because they can tax. But during the 1930s, as the question points out, you know, municipalities didn't have these absolutely uh, massive pension obligations that threatened to bankrupt them. I think that high quality municipal bonds are certainly not that risky in the aggregate. You know, if you own, you know, say one of the Vanguard municipal bond funds that are so inexpensive that they can get the same yield as other as other funds do, but at, at much higher quality, I think that, you know, there, you, you shouldn't necessarily avoid them. But I think that less than half of your bond portfolio should be in munis. And less than half of your munis should be obviously in, in a single state muni. As, as attractive as that may be, if you're in California or New York, you're taking too much concentrated risk by you know, owning all of your munis in, in one state. One other item that you've talked about in the past is owning commodity producing assets like uh, gold miners and, and such. Is that still on your radar screen to buy uh, things like the gold miners and not, not buying gold, but commodity producers as a diversification hedge? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the data, on how commodities producers do during hyperinflationary periods, they do extremely well. Now, realize always that in th there are three things you have to understand about stocks at inflation. Number one is that in the short term, when you see unexpected inflation, stocks do take a hit, okay? But in the much longer term, stocks are a claim on real assets. They make products that get priced in real terms. They uh, own assets that get priced in real terms, in real terms. And when you look at how well stocks have done internationally during periods of hyperinflation, on average, they do very well. I mean, the worst, the most, or not the worst, but the most famous example of hyperinflation was the Weimar hyperinflation between roughly 1920 and the end, the beginning of 1920 and the end of 1923. And when you look at German stock returns during that period, they had a positive real rate of return. All right. Uh, and that's true, been true of any number of countries. I mean, Israel uh, and Chile, for example, during the 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s and 90s had extremely high inflation. But the real rate of return on their equities was it was equal to that of, you know, the United of the United States. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that the stocks that do particularly well are two kinds of stocks. One is value stocks do well with inflation because their liabilities get, get inflated away and flow to their bottom line because value stocks tend to be more leveraged uh, or indebted than, than growth stocks are. Uh, but more importantly, 
uh, they, you know, commodities producers also do extremely well. They don't all do well, but a few of them do well enough that they save your bacon. So if you invest, for example, in base metals, equities and uh, oil stocks and gold stocks, one of those three is going to do well enough that your bacon is going to get saved. Now, how much of your portfolio do you devote to that sort of thing? Not very much, just enough to take the pain, you know, take the edge off of the pain. You know, if, 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 if you have a horrible uh, financial crisis and gold stocks do well, uh, instead of your portfolio losing 30 percent, maybe it only loses 25 percent. Isn't there a lot of overlap between value investing and you know, commodities like oil producers and such? They tend to show up in a lot of value indexes. That's true. Gold stocks don't, though. Bill, you've been a, uh, always been a wonderful guest at the Bogleheads conferences. When you go, you generously give your time to answering questions. And if I could just get you to comment about the Bogleheads and uh, where do you see everything going now that Jack, unfortunately, has passed away? Well, you know, let me make a general statement about the Bogleheads, which is that you will not encounter a group of even, you know, small investors or institutional investors who are more sophisticated, you know, who understand stochastics, who understand portfolio theory, who understand efficient markets, and, you know, who are smart enough not to be distracted by the news. It's, it's almost an, an alternative universe. It's, it's, it's like, almost like you're on a different investment planet, and it's a, it's a very nice place to be. Um, the, the, the conference this year filled up very slightly slower instead of filling up inside of six hours. It sold out inside of like less than a day, I think. Maybe you better. Uh, so I think it's going to do just fine. I think that, you know, we're all going to miss Jack, but obviously there's a lot, you know, there are a lot more reasons why people come to the Bogleheads than, than to hear Jack talk, as, as great as his talks were. You know, we continue to march. We have to continue to uh, spread the word. We had the 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 person who was holding the flame, and now here we are, you know, mind me dating myself, we, we with our Bic lighters have to follow. That's what it's all about. I, th I thought you were going to say Zippo lighters, but all right. I'm in a Bic lighter, uh, if I recall, but you're, I know it. Yeah, Zippo is a little bit, it actually predates me. There, it shows the age between you and I, so there you go. <laughs> Uh, listen, Bill, thank you so much for being our guest on the Bogleheads. Uh, great to have you, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you at the Bogleheads reunion. And um, thanks for being on the show. Okay, it was my pleasure, and I look forward to uh, seeing you as well. You take it easy. This concludes the 13th episode of Bogleheads on Investing. I'm your host, Rick Ferry. Join us each month to hear a new special guest. In the meantime... Visit Bogleheads.org and the Bogleheads Wiki. Participate in the forum and help others find the forum. Thanks for listening. Thanks.